So this, this uh, hour of the day is about rethinking the privacy innovation conundrum. Uh, and we're very lucky to have Paul Zarsky here. Uh, he's the Vice Dean of the University of Haifa School of Law, and he's also visiting here at Penn this semester. Uh, he's a wide-ranging scholar whose work spans complex topics, including privacy, cybersecurity, data governance, and telecom, and he does so with fluency across jurisdictions. I can also attest he's a great co-teacher, uh, because he's co-teaching a fintech class with Tom Baker, and, and, and it's a great experience so far. Uh, so without further ado, Tom, oh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been called many things, but a great co-teacher as a, <laughs> this is the first. And I need to make a correction. I'm not the vice dean right now. I mean, I'm on leave from being the vice dean. Parole. <laughs> Parole, yes, but I have. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Yu and, and, and David uh, uh, for organizing um, this event and inviting me to uh, revisit some ideas. I've been talking uh, about this issue for uh, uh, um, many years, and I also maybe in the Q&A to talk about various anecdotes I have on this uh, matter. Um, what I want to try and do is uh, three things in the 20-minute version of this talk. One would be uh, provide some introduction to uh, basic uh, concepts that will move us forward. The second would be try and provide an initial mapping of how I see the two concepts of privacy and innovation meeting. And we see uh, often these two concepts brought together um, in academia, but also in, uh, uh, in media, in, in public speech. So let's see. Uh, how they uh, meet together, and what I think about the relationship between them. And, and then maybe uh, we'll elaborate on the last one, perhaps most provocative uh, uh, connection between privacy and innovation, that perhaps privacy is a tax on innovation, and see what we think about that idea. OK, so, um, so as I said, this is the, the motivation uh, for our uh, talk, and, and uh, what I think is important is that well, maybe we start a conversation or educate ourselves on a conversation moving forward, and when we hear these two words together in a sentence, we should uh, be able to think about it skeptically. Um, and there's a broader framing here, and I'm also very careful. I have two versions of this talk when I give it in, the e in Europe uh, and when I give it in the US. Um, there's a whole, actually, different vision of this from the Israeli perspective, which I'm not going to bring up, but I, I, I could talk about it in the Q&A. So um, Europe perhaps sees this whole discussion as an attack. Uh, in the US, with the entrance of the new privacy law in California, maybe we have a special moment to see how privacy might impact innovation. Um, that, is, that is to, uh, to be seen. Now, uh, basic terminology, uh, we're not going to have Privacy 101 or 202 here, um, but when we um, think about privacy, we're generally thinking about FIPS, Fair Information Privacy Practices. I know uh, uh, Kathy and Yafit might take issue with that, but generally that's how we see privacy, which the basis is laws pertaining to notice, choice, uh, notice prior to collecting information, choice, whether information would be collected or not, access to some of the information, having certain levels of control of its subsequent uses, uh, understanding of what's happening with your information, security of your information, um, and enforcement of such laws. Now, um, when you think about the role of personal data in the IT industry, you could think, I think, of generally of two uh, um, roles which came up in, in my recent comment. One is uh, it's something that's fed into the machine. It's the inputs. Based on the information you have, you can produce insights, algorithms, ideas, um, business models, many other things. Now that's one perspective. The second perspective is Privacy laws are actually an impact of how you design your data-related business, what you can do with data that you get, how you analyze it, how you present it. Um, so I, I'm going to use the words input and output, supply and demand throughout the talk. 
um, when thinking of how privacy interacts with an IT-based initiative. Okay, now another more advanced question we perhaps need to think about when we think about privacy is how do we define the norm, what stands behind it. Uh, I mentioned this notion of control, I should have control over my information, how it's used, um, where it's going, and this is a very uh, European perspective at this time. It's, uh, many would believe, what stands behind uh, European data, uh, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. U.S. is more... Uh, harm directed, you're thinking about what might happen from using your personal information. And above everything, there's a theory of rights, uh, foundational right in privacy, and in Europe, uh, in the EU, a uh, foundational right, um, human right in data protection. So that's enough, I think, for us to proceed. Um, it's, I don't know, two. 06, uh, we started 9.30, and I haven't heard anyone try to define what innovation is. So I put this slide in just in case uh, people in this room are far more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but innovation is not invention, and it's not diffusion. It's something in the middle. People have different concepts of what uh, that is. And... Um, in an uh, article in the World of Environment that uh, Kathy and Yafit write about and disagree with, and I agree with it a bit more, uh, Professor Stewart from NYU, when he thinks about innovation, he says we need to distinguish between two forms of innovation. What would be market innovation, which will be generally what we think about innovation? Technologies that allow firms to uh, enhance their revenues. Um, and then we have social innovation, which when we look at the aggregate, whether this form of innovation actually had led to enhancing the public good. And it's very easy to think about situations that you will have a technology that leads to one and not the other. Okay, now two final points on innovation. One already, uh, 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 Shane Greenstein noted, innovation doesn't just happen, right? So this idea that you want us to innovate, just leave us alone. That is totally untrue, and, and I can't uh, elaborate on that better than what we learned in the morning. Uh, second, innovation is not just a word that we throw out there, but it is a measurable context. It's a measurable concept. And there are various ways to do it, through patents, through citations. There's the wor uh, work of uh, Manuel Trachtenberg that he connects both. Um, so um, I think those are two general concepts that we should bear in mind regarding innovation. Okay, now, when trying to think of, uh, the talk is called Revisiting, so just one thing to keep in mind is this very recent book by Shoshana Zuboff, uh, Surveillance Capitalism. Those of you who have read all 600 uh, uh, pages, very good. Those read only the book review, okay, that's pretty good also. So, uh, um, this book details uh, very extensively of how technology has moved to create this whole notion of surveillance capitalism. So just quickly to bring it into the paradigm that we're talking about, this book details extensive innovation, okay? So is this a book about uh, good things or bad things? It, it's a very negative book, but it's still about innovation. Uh, the book also talks extensively about extracting consumer surplus, that Google and Facebook are collecting a great deal of information about us and then using that information generally to our detriment. So going back to the paradigm, to the Stuart paradigm I just mentioned, um, sorry. so Stuart would say that here we have a market innovation, but clearly no social innovation. Now, what do we take away from this? Do we say that all this innovation is negative? Depends on your perspective. You might say that having innovation is good. The problem that we have this consumer surplus extraction is problematic, and we need to figure out how the consumer will get the surplus back. Or perhaps everything needs to be stopped. Okay, I'll just leave you with this thought while we walk forward. Okay, so in this second part of the talk, we're going to think about how we see these two notions of privacy and innovation tied together, and then what I think about.
and I'll generally tell you I think most of them are just wrong. So the first point here, this isn't working, um, is, is an acceptable notion in Europe that says that privacy is very important for innovation because privacy creates an environment of trust, and when you have greater trust, there's going to be more market innovation, and thereafter there'll be more social innovation. And therefore, we need to have greater privacy in society and greater privacy laws. Now, um, this position was forwarded by academics and leading European uh, regulators up until recently. Now, I think that this paradigm is generally false. Now, there are two reasons why you could think it's false. For one reason would be, if privacy is so great, so why do we need to force the firms to engage that way? They'll just figure out that it's good for their business and do so on their own. I don't think this is a valid critique because, um, and this is earlier work by uh, Kathy Stramberg, uh, firms have strong reasons why they got tied into this current practice. And if we don't generate any form of regulation, they're going to be stuck in this business model that's, to a great extent, uh, anti-privacy. So that's not a good argument. But what is a better argument is we have no idea that this is really working. There is no proof showing that if you have more trust in the economy, you have more innovation in it. We don't see any correlations between societies with privacy and without privacy and greater e-commerce in one of them as opposed to the other. But this is a general argument. I'm putting it out there and um, we could think about it later. A second argument, I'll go through this quickly, saying that privacy is very important for innovation um, because privacy generates an environment where people engage in greater uh, freedom in greater uh, uh, creativity and thus in greater innovation. Again, the problem with this argument is that it's too abstract. Innovation is something that's measurable um, and there's, there's no proof to show that this has any hold. Okay, but this is just um, a second point that's out there. A third point that has generated a great deal of traction in academic writing, one of my colleagues, Michal Gal, wrote about this extensively is a linkage between privacy, competition, and innovation. And it goes as follows. It says, at this point, we have a major failure in the IT markets. We have several large firms that because of their privacy or lack thereof practices have amassed a vast amount of information. And that allowed them to entrench themselves into a position in the market from which they cannot be removed. And this is generating a competition-related problem. So how will we solve it? We will generate stronger privacy protections. And therefore, the holding of these companies on the market will be somewhat released. And greater innovation in the IT space will emerge. OK. Now, this point, going back to the basic taxonomy I offered, it focuses on the inputs, right? It says that to have successful startups, companies need to have data, but all the data is held by these large companies that already have it and are not sharing it. So we need to tinker with privacy to enhance innovation. Now, I take issue with these basic arguments. Um, I agree that we might have a problem in the IT world some companies have gotten too big and their control over data, personal data, is too strong. There might be need for uh, antitrust measures against them. I'm not going to give a voice and opinion on that, but I don't think it has anything to do with privacy at this point. There's possible steps that could be taken, but it shouldn't come from privacy law with it. Um, unfortunately, the GDPR, for instance, set in place provisions which require data portability, which might be a good idea, but I don't think it should come from privacy law itself. Now, quite to the contrary, privacy laws might be inhibiting on startups because startups could gain access to personal information on secondary markets, what will be very difficult 
if you enhance privacy laws. And, and we'll talk about this in a moment, privacy laws also limit the business models that startups could innovate in. So this argument is somewhat tricky. Now this brings us to argument number four, which also has gained traction in the environmental uh, context in the US and currently in the EU, saying that privacy law enhances innovation because based on laws such as the GDPR in Europe, we're seeing a great deal of innovation in the privacy space. Many companies have uh, stepped forth and set up business models to comply with GDPR, to control where your data is going, to assure that there is adherence to the concept of use limitation and specification, that you're only do using data the way you are supposed to. So there's a great deal of innovation in that space. Okay, now this actually goes to a point when we talk about technological forcing, that you set up a regulatory system that forces innovation in a specific direction. Now, that might exist, but in the literature, when you think about the efficiency of such a system, there's a great deal of skepticism because they say there's perhaps innovation in one context, but loss of innovation in other contexts where people were thinking of going, but now they cannot. And it's very difficult to measure this other level of innovation, but there's no reason to believe that the innovational gains we're having in one context where we're pointing people are greater than these other contexts where we're actually forbidding and limiting. Okay, so, now we get to the fifth point, which is very provocative in various circles, which says, actually it's the other way around. Privacy is undermining innovation. And it does so for two reasons that we already mentioned. When you have privacy laws, so when you enter uh, a new area, you have less information to work through about individuals and therefore there's less things that you could develop. That's one point. And the second point is privacy laws actually are limiting the design of what you could carry out. And therefore if you limit design, you limit business models you could carry out, you limit your ideas, there's going to be less innovation. Now this argument is very intuitive to the degree that it's borderline manipulation. Um, and that's what I want to explore now. Does this argument, which is very popular, does it hold water? And uh, what do we think of it? Very quickly, I'll mention it uh, analytically and empirically. Now, analytically, this is a very strange argument. It's, it's borderline comical because if I would come here and say, oh, uh, we need to uh, uh, sustain the Second Amendment because we're very concerned about innovations in the gun industry, or um, we, uh, uh, we need to uh, loosen uh, regulation of gambling or pornography because these industries drive a great deal of innovation in technology. So someone forwarding such an assertion will be laughed out of a room in, in the good case, right? So why can we get away with my previous slide? What does this actually tell us about this argument? So some might say that this Argument, argument nine or five, number five is completely bogus because it misunderstands what privacy is. Privacy is a basic human right. It's not something that you should be measuring against innovation. Okay, however, we do hear this argument a great deal. So let's try and give it some credit. I'm not sure that it deserves. This actually might be telling us two things about privacy law. One, it might be saying that privacy law, not in its core, right, but perhaps in its periphery, seems to be too uncertain and abstract. And once you allow privacy law to expand, you're injecting too much uncertainty into the innovative environment. That's something that innovators, or perhaps more importantly, their funders really don't like uncertainty. So that's a problem when you have privacy in a space, it's inhibiting innovation because of uncertainty. Now, that also doesn't sound too good because then the answer would be, okay, let's 
just add stricter and clearer privacy laws. However, there's another answer. And the other answer might say, okay, privacy is a human right at its core. But at least in the US, in its periphery, there's no real agreement that actually this right should hold. Maybe when we forward this argument, we're saying privacy should not be expanded for a normative reason because we don't believe that the concept of privacy as it's, as it's accepted in the EU should be accepted in the US. And therefore, innovation is an argument towards an unconvincing uh, right. Okay, now I need to uh, conclude my talk, but uh, the last provocation here would be, can we actually make an argument that because we have less innovation in the EU, which has a stronger data protection regime, and we have more innovation in the US, which has a different, and one would say more lenient privacy uh, Regula regulatory structure, is that telling us anything about the relation between privacy and innovation? Now, generally, the answer is no, because the EU and the US are so different in so many levels that you can't make this uh, argument connecting the correlation to the causation on this level. However, it does, however, lead us to think about this deeply and perhaps figure out where we might have points of natural experiments where laws are changing in one or both regimes and look what will happen thereafter. And we're having changes in Asia and perhaps some changes in California. And we should look at these instances and see how they might reflect on the connection between privacy and innovation. There's much more to be said, but I want to hear uh, Catherine in your feet and then follow up. Great, thank you, Professor Zarsky. Uh, now we'll have commentary from Catherine Strandberg and Yafit Lev Aretz. Uh, Professor Strandberg is at the NYU School of Law and her work is highly influential in the fields of patent law, information privacy, innovation policy, uh, and also further to our discussion of public-private partnerships. She started her career as a theoretical physicist at Argonne National Lab. Uh, and uh, Professor Lev Aretz is at the Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College, uh, and her scholarship engages with tough questions concerning algorithmic decision-making, big data, uh, and public and private uses of data in the digital age. So. So, um, oops, where do I find Well, I'm going to talk while someone figures out how to get our slides up here. <laughs> um, and, and the main thing I want to say, besides saying thank you um, for inviting us here, is, is to sort of make a, um, a, a, a apology in advance for, for, um, I think, I think we're outdoing the people who say they were being shameless earlier because they were the actual speakers and they were promoting books. So uh, we're actually going to talk about our own paper in, terms of, in, in order to comment on Tall's, and um, at least to start with. And the reason that we're doing that, though, um, is that Tall wrote his original paper on this five, it was published five years ago. And we've been in conversation with him about this issue for a very long time, and long enough that we actually wrote a whole, a couple of papers um, that, in, at least in part, responded to his paper. So, uh, so we decided that it, it would probably be useful to talk about what we said in our paper, um, and and then we can go move on from there. Um, and this is kind of typical Tall. Like half of my research agenda is responding to what Tall already wrote like five years ago that we're all now realizing is important. So, um, okay. Uh, so when we, when we started thinking about this question, um, we, are fo we focused on the question of privacy regulation and innovation, which is a little bit narrow than um, what his paper talks about, because he talks about privacy and innovation. We're just talking about privacy, thinking about privacy regulation and innovation. And we were responding not only to some of Tull's work, but also to this kind of common uh, trope, like, oh, privacy regulation is going to stifle innovation. And we just wanted to understand what it is you mean, what do people mean when they say this, and what can it meaningfully mean? Uh, because there's the question, which privacy regulation? There could be many different kinds. Which innovation? And exactly how does this happen? And 
there was a surprisingly, to us at least, sparse previous literature on these questions, um, with Tall's paper standing out, a few others. And one of the things that was noticeable to us, which motivated our work, is that because we are both um, IP scholars as well as privacy scholars, that any kind of perspective on this regulation innovation question uh, that kind of came from the, the perspective of IP theorists was kind of missing. So we're, we wanted to bring that in. Um, so a few points about regulation, innovation, and markets. Um, I think a really important point to be made is that innovation is not a commodity. And by that, I mean a couple of things. Um, one is we can't just say innovation as though it's all the same. Um, it's which innovation? What are we talking about? And also, any given market is going to produce some portfolio of innovative activity. And that's really what we care about. We care about what is this portfolio of innovative activity. We don't just care about some cumulative number of how much innovation there is. And just as a kind of side note that we could discuss later, I think I disagree pretty strongly with you that innovation can be measured. I think we've been trying to measure it for a long time. and We have still no idea what we're doing in trying to measure it. But we can try. Um, but anyway, importantly, the portfolio of innovative activity that you get out of our market um, comes from sort of two-sided things. So on one side is what are the demand signals that the um, that players in the market, suppliers to the market, are, are seeing out there? What do they think customers would buy? But then, and here's where we're bringing the IP, um, IP perspective. The other thing that determines what innovative activity actually happens is what does the appropriability landscape look like? In other words, if I'm a potential innovator, not only what do people buy, but how much am I going to be able to recoup? And so in order to think about this question of innovation and regulation, we have to bring together some stories. There's, there are sort of two classic stories and three non-classic stories. So there's a sort of classic, and these are very oversimplified, regulation story. And one way to think about regulation, what are we doing with regulation sort of classically, is we're trying to realign the market demand portfolio, the portfolio out there of what should we be supplying, with a better social portfolio of social values and benefit. Okay. But on the other hand, we know regulation has various kinds of social costs, including transaction costs, regulatory design errors, and so on and so forth. And we generally try to have policy approaches to get the benefits that we want to get and try to deal with some of these other issues, which we've talked about already um, on, uh, in them earlier today. Okay, then there's the classic IP story, which we really, somewhat surprisingly, in a, in a uh, conference about innovation, we haven't talked about yet today. So um, let's talk about that. The classic IP story is, well, we need IP exclusivity. Um, essentially, and this is not the terminology normally used, but essentially to, uh, to level the, don't we get 20 minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. I yeah, we get 20. Okay. <laughs> You're terrifying me there. Um, essentially to level the appropriability landscape, right? So the reason we need IP, the free rider story, is, well, if we don't have IP, then we got, even if we invent something that there's great consumer demand for, we're not going to be able to get any returns back on it. We're not going to be able to appropriate returns because everybody will just copy it and free ride. Um, so it's a story about appropriability. IP is about fixing the appropriability landscape um, in order to restore us to a sort of more level playing field, com competent, competitive market. But IP also is socially costly for various reasons that are sort of well known in the IP uh, arena. And so what do we do about this? We have limiting doctrines on IP. So we have IP, but it doesn't last forever. We, only, we don't always give it out, etc. cetera. Um, so those are the two classic stories, and how do these things come together? How does regulation and innovation come together? Um, well, what regulation does is shift market demand, and including demand for innovation. So if we have well-designed regulation, which of course we're not always going to get, right? But let's just say if we could get well-designed regulation, what is it going to do to the innovation portfolio? It's going to shift it. So yes, we're going to have lower demand for some kinds of innovations. We're going to stifle them because no one will want them because the regulation isn't allowing them. That's the whole point. So we're going to lower demand for the less desirable innovations, and we're going to increase demand for the more desirable innovations. Shifting the innovation portfolio like that is a feature of regulation. It's not a bug. 
right? So if we do the regulation right, of course, some innovation becomes less desirable. That's the point. Um, so if we really have, have well-designed regulation, then talking about stifling is kind of a, a meaningless and uh, I think sort of contentious uh, kind of language. Now, of course, regulation is not always going to be well-designed. Um, but to the extent that we're worried about stifling social valuable innovation, we should realize that both badly designed regulation and failing to regulate when we want to regulate, when we're not getting the uh, goods and services and innovations of the types that we want, are both likely to stifle socially valuable innovation. We just can't avoid that. We can't be perfect. The other kind of argument is to say, well, innovation is so unpredictable, so we shouldn't regulate it. But this, ha this argument has the same problem. Unpredictability affects the regulated innovation portfolio and the unregulated innovation portfolio. And bottom line for us is that in practice, we regulate all kinds of innovation critical arenas, environmental, health and safety, and so forth. Um, so from the point of view of privacy, um, why, would, why is privacy different? We want to say privacy is another one of those. And it has all the po positives and negatives that we already can talk about. Um, we want to also have another sort of not so classic story about IP and barriers to entry. Um, so besides uh, the barriers to the um, problems with appropriability that come from free rider problems that people who talk about IP are really familiar with, we can also have barriers to entry that come from natural things such as network effects and first mover advantages. And the only point to make about this is that these are normally thought of as competition problems, but they also are way, they're also are problems that distort what portfolio of innovation that we get. IP doctrine tries to account for some of these effects. Antitrust doctrine tries to deal with others of them. Um, but, you know, we still have this situation where we have the regulatory regulation aiming at demand problems, and then we're trying to account for IP and barriers to entry, mostly, I mean, sorry, for appropriability problems, mostly with competition law and IP law. Um, so, in general, we kind of assume we can do these things, like this is like we have IP people over here thinking about IP, we have regulation people over here thinking about IP, and we kind of assume we can do these two enterprises completely separately. And actually, I think most of the time that's true, or very often that's true, because it doesn't, it's, there's no real connection between the mistakes you make on the regulation side and the mistakes you make on the IP and the appropriability side. So they don't tend to get, uh, to amplify one another. So this is often true that we can just have separate conferences about regulation and IP. Um, but there are exceptions when there's a correlation between appropriability problems and um, regular and sort of demand side problems. And those have to be thought of in regulatory design. And why are we talking about this when we're talking about privacy regulation? Because privacy regulation is a place where this happens, where we have to worry about both. Um, so in our work on this, and this is something, you know, we don't really engage with the question of is privacy socially valuable? We pretty much assume it. But we also go through and talk about lots of reasons to think that market demand is going to be misaligned. Market demand for privacy regulation is going to be misaligned. Uh, there's a lot of literature on this, so I won't talk about it unless people want to. Um, so, but we also just assume that it's going to be possible to design at least somewhat effective privacy regulation, just like you can for other arenas. If you basically think it's impossible to design effective regulation, then, you know, fine, you disagree with us. Um, but if you think that it's possible to design somewhat effective regulation in general, then we think it's possible for privacy also. Um, and why is privacy a little bit special for um, this question of can we think separately about regulation and innovation? Um, it's because of the fact that in privacy, not pri in, in personal information-based markets, which is really what we're talking about, so also, I think this is some place where all, we might also be a little bit of a difference with Tall. That we think about, when we say privacy regulation, we mean appropriate information flow as socially determined. Not control, not necessarily control, not necessarily 
uh, individualized uh, consent and so forth. We think that's a question. That's an open regulatory design question. Um, but in fact, in these kind of markets, there are the problems, some of which Tal already mentioned, of natural barriers to entry that come from ne network effects, in some cases from data aggregation effects. There are reasons to believe also that free riding problems, which are usually the big deal for innovation, are not that large um, because it's not so easy to free ride on, on a whole bunch of data that some entity has, has collected. Um, and the limiting doctrines of IP that are normally, um, we normally rely on, mostly it's trade secrecy in this area and trade secrecy's limiting doctrines are really not meant for data. There are things like reverse engineering, which is not something you can really do with data. So we think trade secrecy and these natural barriers to entry are likely to end up being ending in over-deterrence of follow-on innovation. Um, so what does this all have to do with privacy regulation? Um, basically, we say privacy regulation can affect innovation. Yes, we agree. Um, but we don't think that's necessarily in a bad way. Um, design of privacy regulation, first of all, can shift innovation so that it's going more in areas which are both more demanded but also with fewer appropriability problems. And to get good social policy, you kind of need to take both into account. So, so we'll stop here. Um, bottom line, just a few bottom line points. The first one is innovation is not a commodity. It is we think somewhat meaningless to talk about more and less innovation. I don't know what the units are. I don't know how we, we figure that out. What we care about is the portfolio and overall social benefit. Um, we also don't think that the question of innovation should be an anti-regulation trump card for the, because of the, for those reasons. And maybe the main thing to emphasize, especially in the area of privacy regulation, is that everything depends on how you design the regulation. And there's been, we think, really way too little work, even especially including from us, um, on how one should design privacy regulation to get done what we want to accomplish. So we, we would not say that you should just assume FIPS or assume the GDPR or assume anything about the, the, per the current design of privacy regulation. Um, and our kind of main point is instead of let's, instead of debating whether we want to have privacy regulation, we should think about which privacy regulation we want to have and how it's going to interact with innovation. Okay, so that's probably enough to say I have some more specific comments, but maybe we'll just do our, wait and do our, uh, have a little more of a conversation. Actually, do have slides to respond, but you'll believe me that it's on the slides. Yes, I, uh, I'm not going to bring them. Okay, uh, so I'll make uh, three quick points. No, no. I, I don't want to put them because I misspelled Yafit's last name. <laughs> Sorry. I shouldn't. You should not report this wrong. Yeah, yeah, but that was why I misspelled it. Right? I already apologized. So I'm not going to do it. Okay. One point was. Um, Linking uh, the discussion of IP innovation, privacy innovation, I think must come with a caveat, which uh, I, I want to uh, emphasize. I think it's quite natural to say that IP, the extent of IP regulation, both patent, copyright, trademark, uh, trade secret, uh, could be calibrated based on the innovation outputs because to a great extent, the reason we have IP is to promote innovation. Now I know that there's a strong position, especially from authors, composers, whatnot, that uh, IP uh, comes from a natural right and I'm willing to uh, uh, live with that to some extent, but uh, at least in this country, much of IP policy comes from promoting innovation. And if we see that it's not achieving its objective, so it's natural to say, let's curb the extent of that regulation. Not the same with privacy and data protection, which comes from a very different realm in law and therefore less uh, intuitive to say that one should be limited uh, to affect the other. A second point, uh, um, 
much of what Kafi and Yafit showed actually focused on uh, the second, one of the two elements I talked of the interaction between privacy and innovation, how privacy will drive demand, okay? What uh, you could do uh, in terms of your software design, um, and then that will uh, affect the demand for your product. However, privacy has yet another perspective, which is, I call it the supply side. Uh, how much info data personal data you have to work with when you're developing your product. And, and this is very tricky because um, we're in a global economy. So the example here is uh, assume you have a certain country or state where you have lax privacy protections. Now, you're actually developing for export. I'm not going to name any countries or names, but you're developing for export. Now, um, when you develop, when you're in such a situation, you're mindful of the demand laws in other countries, but you're also mindful of the usage supply side on, uh, within your country. Um, and this is a problem in privacy law because um, if you're a certain country that you uh, want to promote privacy, um, you could affect how companies will perhaps develop models in your country and companies that are trying to come into your country what they could offer your customers. But if they're very strong models, products being developed in other countries, you can't really stop that. You, it's very difficult for you to block that unless you have a global environment. So now let's say, think of the EU or Europe. They're in a very tricky situation because they care about privacy. They see these new tools emerging around the world. Their customers know about them, and yet we're telling them that they can't use them. So this is all a result of this very, uh, I think, special situation you have in privacy law that it affects both the supply and demand side. And when you understand this, you could perhaps understand why the jurisdiction of the GDPR is so broad, because if they can't have this global move, the EU is going to lose from both ends, right? Its users are going to be subjected to tools, measures, business models that are uh, in incoherence with their concept of privacy and are going to be losing the jobs, uh, opportunities, minds, and money which come from developing these tools which will continue to be outside the EU. What's going to happen in California in the next few years is very interesting. We will have to see. Okay, I'll stop here. All right, with that, I'll, I'll ask the first question. Uh, and so, in terms of uh, how that type of dynamic that you just described to all plays out in the United States, uh, is that the type of dynamic that counsels in favor of harmonization at the federal level? Or is uh, federalism and experimentation with privacy policies uh, at the state level just something along the lines of portfolio shaping the way that, that Kathy, you described? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about the innovation effects of harmonization versus uh, federalism. So, so this actually unfolded in this uh, symposium uh, in the Yale Law Journal like six, seven years ago. And uh, uh, um, recently I've, I've written about this in, in Hebrew, however. And uh, I think we're seeing interesting dynamics in this uh, um, non-harmonization -harm uh, dynamic, that we see some form of competition between regulators. It came up before in what uh, Tom Baker was talking about in a previous talk. So perhaps... A lack of federalism does make sense here. Um, I know there's this notion here of the race between um, states on the one hand and the fact that you could have a safe harbor in one state and then affect the others. Um, so it's, it's a close call, but I tend to think that perhaps having a competition between regulators here might be more helpful. But this is just an intuition. So it's my initial thoughts on that are sort of two di different things. So on the one hand, I think we have so we have done so little serious thinking about various possible approaches to privacy or privacy regulation design. I mean, really, we have like two models that we've had for forty years, <laughs> and we haven't done. When you look, when you compare it to something like environmental law or safety law. Um, so we've done so little of that that I think it would be great to have 
lots of different uh, experimentation in that sense, um, because we just don't know very much about what works. Um, I also think that having that kind of experimentation would allow us to tease out a little bit more questions about what exactly it is that we want, because if, um, you know, we take the position of privacy is contextually appropriate information flow, that means it doesn't always mean less information flow. It, it might mean having some regulation that makes certain kinds of information with among certain parties more likely to flow. I think of, um, in a sort of old-fashioned sense, attorney-client privilege, right? The point of it is to have more information flow, not less. So there's a lot of one can think of about that. On the other point, though, I, I, think, I, I think that when we talk about demand, we are including the idea that when you think of what do, what, what do we want as a society, it is like, is this, we could get this product, is it worth having this product if we're also going to do this? So I think it goes all the way up the input chain. I mean, it's really not that specific to privacy. It's like, do you want to buy products that were made with child labor in, the, in another country, right? It's a somewhat similar idea. Um, if you, and you know, you can come out different ways on that depending on whether it's child labor or whether it's, minimum wage laws or whether it's, you know, whatever, you can say, we don't, we don't want to have this kind of information flow of our information, even if it means we have to, we have to sacrifice certain, you know, innovations. Oh, but they're going to make it anyway, and we, we're happy to buy it. Well, maybe we, that's fine. Maybe we say, yeah, we are, since they decided it was worth it for them. Or maybe we say, eh, you know, we don't think they are freely choosing this either, so we are going to regulate whether we buy it. I, I don't feel like personal information is actually so sui generis in, in that regard. Yeah, maybe I'll just add that um, this kind of arms race is a very vibrant discussion that is going on right now around AI uh, with China and the whole TikTok story. Oh, and, yeah. uh, so I, and, and it's not just about, just like Kathy said, it's not about just about personal information. And just one more point about harmonization. Um, it's important to remember that it can be done formally, but also informally. So it could be done formally by regulation, but it could be done informally by the private sector just pursuing the same kind of rules across the board. And we see that with the Brussels effect of the GDPR, and we're probably going to see more of that after the CCPA. Questions from the audience? Check. Yeah, my question is really right on what you just said, which is, uh, aren't we seeing essentially a natural experiment between uh, uh, European firms underneath GDPR and uh, firms in developed countries who are not otherwise covered by GDPR and sort of in the private sector, we're seeing the, the you know, startups going one direction in one set of countries and going another in the other set. Can't we use that as a way to try to understand at least some of the consequences? So, uh, as I said, in the last eight years, I've been talking about this and having a very different conversation in Europe and the U.S. Um, and when I talk to economists about this, they get very upset because they said you can't have uh, talk about a design that's based on just on two groups who are so different. Um, there's so many other reasons that I elaborate, uh, lack of VC funding, lack of, lack of academic uh, hubs, and of course there's no word for entrepreneur in French and all these kind of things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, so in, in the last comment you see how, how absurd uh, uh, like many of these arguments are. Um, now, I, my, much of this paper came about out of an intuition just along the lines you said, and the most I could say is that Maybe I can't prove it, but at least the world, as we see it, doesn't disprove it, which I think is, is pretty good, okay? Um, but we should uh, keep on looking for these forms of natural uh, experiments, certainly. I think that I, I agree with that, but I also have a kind of hesitation or caveat on it, which is that what I think would be very unfortunate, um, and I'm afraid may be what happens, <laughs> is if we were to say, okay, now we got this great natural experiment. We got privacy regulation and no privacy regulation. And then we have innovation and no innovation. At least let's see which one wins. And of course, GDPR is a particular sort of regulation. I have lots of things I would criticize about it, in fact. I think a lot of privacy scholars do. 
Um, and does it enhance or not from innovation? Again, you run into the same problem of, is that what we care about? Like the total, how do we even measure the total amount of innovation? It's a, it's a, so, which is not to say I have an answer. I don't necessarily have an answer, but I don't think it's, and I'm sure interested in seeing the studies. Like I want to see them, but I don't think we should overinterpret them. Can I? Uh, I, I have half a dozen studies I can send to <laughs> you. I'm happy to let you be the, yeah. I mean, there, the reviewers for the journals. Very, <laughs> it's very early for these studies still yeah. too. So I, they're starting to come out, but it's very early. Can I quickly say that uh, based on, on Shane's talk in the morning, I actually have many anecdotes that I spoke to people uh, worldwide, Israel, U.S., EU, and many of them are along, they, sh they come up with promoting this story. But, um, and some of them I include in the paper. I mean, I could just mention uh, uh, the uh, Schuler uh, and... Uh, Two, two company, one company in Germany that had two arms that were like Facebook, um, and I'm not going to say it because my German isn't good enough, so I'm not going to say the names, but um, at one point they were much more powerful than Facebook in Germany, and when Facebook came, they gave him a deal. They said, we'll give you 1% of Facebook if uh, we could merge, and they said, that's a terrible deal for us. And of course, a year later, they were bankrupt, and they would have made like, an incredible amount of money if they were taking that deal. And when I talked to people in that company, they said, we, we just couldn't compete with Facebook because of the way German privacy law is structured. Um, so, but the, I, pro the problem is, okay, so what's the conclusion from right, that? That's right. Facebook has been a, such a great contribution to social benefit. I mean, <laughs> no, seriously, like a couple of years ago, I think we saw it in a little different way than we do now. And that, that's why it's such a hard, yeah. I think it's such Just a really, what the story truly, is what it is. Yeah, it's such a truly difficult, um, difficult question because it's, it's policy all the way down, really. Yes. <laughs> yeah, really interesting discussion. Um, I was wondering if maybe policy could intervene at an intermediate level. And I'm thinking particularly about transparency, because a lot of the problems with privacy, people say, well, people don't care about privacy. They use these services. Well, you don't necessarily know. And if you try and read the privacy policy, it's 20 pages long, and it doesn't actually tell you anything specific about what they're collecting or what they're doing with it. It's all these kind of general categories. And it's very hard. You know, I have privacy trackers, and I'm like, oh, wow, there's 50 trackers on this web page, but they're invisible unless you use a third-party app to make them visible. So the default is to hide and obfuscate. Um, and I think at least it, it would create a market for privacy respecting technologies if people could tell, you know, that this one does and this one doesn't in some kind of transparent way. Because now I think there's no effective market for privacy respecting technology. Happy to take that. Um, I think the problem is how we think about privacy. So obviously after Cambridge Analytica, all privacy scholars, we became celebrities. Let me tell you, that was the best time for us. Um, I missed that problem. What is it? I missed that problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, got, we got to tell, we, to say we told you so, and it was great, or not. Um, but I mean, the problem is when, yeah, okay, let's say we have transparency. Let's say we make privacy policies more readable and the notice, notice and consent model is actually a real notice and consent model. The problem is that we all give away our privacy for convenience. We do that all the time. Even if you know what you give up, you will, do, you will still, do, still do that. And I think the problem, I mean, that's my personal opinion, and it's not about this paper particularly. Um, my opinion is that we do that because privacy, when we think about privacy, we're looking for someone who is watching us, and it's just not the case. In most cases today, it's not someone watching us. It's an algorithm watching a data point that is associated with us. And um, if we're not identified, or if someone is not you know, pointing at us specifically at some point, we just simply at some point don't care. And you know, when people, at, at the beginning, I remember my friend saying, yeah, I was looking up this product on Amazon and it was following me throughout the web and it was creepy. Well, we are all used to that by now, right? Well, not all of us. Well, I mean, <laughs> but I think, you know, I, I, I pay you for a Switzerland-based email service specifically because 
it doesn't track me. And I could actually get it for free, and I pay on principle because I want to pay. But you can do that. Privacy. With I mean, one, I, I think there's I mean, a I much more free, economic some problem ways. with the yeah. transparency. Transparency is great. I'm all in favor of it, but I think there's a much more really, you know, economic issue with with using transparency and notice and consent as a as a model, which is that most of these um, products have these huge network effects and data aggregation effects, which mean any given time, if I try to figure out what is the cost to me of giving up this particular piece of personal information at this particular time, there's no well-defined answer to that at all. So if I, let's say it's fine for email, like I can switch email servers, but what if I want to switch social networks? I have to, and actually we have a fellow who's working on uh, thinking about group data portability as a possible you know, responses. But it's very hard to think about that if I don't think about regulation. Or even if I think about what do I know, if, even if I know exactly what is going on with this particular thing, how do I know what data is already out there, what people I, who aren't me already put out about information about me. And so if I come down to the question, how much is it worth to me to not transfer this particular piece of information to this particular party right now? I don't think it's a very well-defined market question at all. So I, I think that's the deeper, really deeper problem. And even further, um, furthermore, we, we all think about privacy as an individual right, but oftentimes we give away information that create externalities for other people. Think about DNA, you know, 23andMe and all those services. Yeah, you, you share information, you share your own DNA, but you create a network of a lot of people who are connected to you. Should you be able to say I agree to that? I'm not sure. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, uh, Derek. Go ahead, Chris. No, no, it's all right. Go, Derek. Okay. Well, one of the things that's been mentioned and concerned with privacy and what have you is uh, going a bit more than notice and consent, but making sure that people in a transparent way have a choice, which is to say, uh, I'll take all your data and give you this for free. Or I won't take any data, and it will cost you 50 bucks a year. Now, how would offering this option change its effect on innovation? And I, I would ask any of the people to say this. So, I'm going to it's answer. A um, it's a great question because Kathy wrote an article about it that I put in my article. <laughs> uh, so I'll give you Kathy's answer. Okay. <laughs> I have uh, uh, my Marshall McClellan right here. Uh, so uh, we, we see um, that, uh, and there's a lot of like, cognitive psychology work on Dan Ariely and whatnot, that people are flabbergasted by this free thing, right? When you're offered something free, so part of your brain turns off. I have it in my family all the time. Nothing like free lunch. Um, so, um, and therefore, um, when you, even the fact that you allow a free option creates this distortion. So um, the, now the sense is, is that the existence of the free creates the distortion in the market, which leads to innovation all flowing in that so-called free direction and killing all the other business models. You would agree to that, I think, because you wrote it. Uh, well, I mean, there's some really interesting experiments that not, I have not done, but that, you know, psychologists have done on the effect of difference between free and, like, you know, one cent. And it's... It's quite remarkably interesting. I, I do think it's an interesting thing to think about, um, and I don't know if it would be feasible as a regulatory matter, but what if you simply requ require companies to offer a paid option? Now, the problem you probably run into there is because the aggregation effects are not only for you, but also for the company, they might want to really push you, because after all, right now, their customers are the, adverti are the advertisers, and it might be that they prefer to have their customers be the advertisers and not be people, but be individuals. And so I don't know how they're going to set the price there and how we're going to think about that. And we don't normally like to get involved in price settings. I, I, I don't know, but I think it's definitely something that's worth thinking. thinking about, right? And it's an example of the kind of regulation 
the kind of regulatory design thing that just hasn't really, for, for what, some reason, has just not been a thing much in privacy. And I mean, I blame myself for that too, because here I am and I haven't done it either, so. But I need to say that Kenny, ba <laughs> Kenny Bamberger published a study with uh, a few other people in Berkeley and they ran a comparison between apps that were paid and apps that were for free for the same service and which one had better privacy. Well, that's also true. That's the also answer true. was, in many right. cases, it was the paid that were worse. But at least, or par, or the paid were worse. So you the would answer at least, is because no one reads, so what does it you matter? You would have right? to have some kind of, something to require that the paid one actually is better. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's thank our panelists.